Hello, Lower School friends. I am so excited about today because as you know, I told you last week that we were starting something very special in the Lower School because we have an extra month of Adar. And because of that, we are doing a whole unit on Shabbat and we're learning all the different things about Shabbat. And in your classrooms, you learned about some special things that we do on Shabbat and even on Yom Tov. And some of those things include making Kiddush and Hamotzi and even you talked about Sudash Lishit and Havdala, and we made Havdala cards. And it's been an amazing week in the lower school. Why am I so excited? Because I have a very special lower school friend who's come to visit us, and his name is Rabbi Rosenbaum. And I'm going to introduce him to you now. Some of you submitted questions for Rabbi Rosenbaum, and he is ready to answer all of those amazing questions that you asked. So welcome, Rabbi Rosenbaum. Thank you for being with us in the lower school. Thank you so much, Mrs. Israel. I, I, first of all, I want to say the questions that were sent in were amazing. They were very special questions. A lot of the children at the Oneg Shabbat, I know, whether it be I know them from Shomre or I know them from being at Dor Lador, or I just know them from around. And I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm so excited I can at least hear your questions and share these thoughts and I thank Mrs. Israel for the opportunity. I thank each and every one of you for taking the time to send in the questions and listen to the video. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. So Rabbi, our first question is from my friend Lenny, and he wants to know, why do we use two chalot for each meal if the man was only two piles? So if we had two chalot for each meal, it's like four, and the man was only two. Great question. So I'm going to give you two answers, Lenny. So the basic answer is that every meal of Shabbat, we should remember that Hashem sent a double portion the day before Shabbat. That's the basic answer. A little bit more of an interesting answer that you can think about on your own is actually some commentators say that every normal day they got two piles of mun, one for breakfast, one for supper. So actually, if on Friday they got a double portion, that means they did get four piles of mun. But you can think that through on your own. But that's a really neat question. That's really interesting. Okay. Yeah, Al asked us, why is hamotzi before Kiddush if it's more important food? That's an excellent question. Uh, you're absolutely right. In a normal meal, if you were going to eat bread and have grape juice, you would definitely make the bracha on bread first. The reason why we have kid the reason why we make kiddush first, kiddush, is because on Shabbat there's a special mitzvah that before we do any eating, we first need to say how special the day of Shabbat is. And the way that the rabbis taught us to say it is over a cup of kiddush, a cup of grape juice. But you're right, in a normal situation, you would make the bracha on bread before the bracha on grape juice. Thank you. That really was a good question. So Rabbi Seth wanted to know, how should we hold the challah? Is there any special way that we should hold it when the bracha is made? That's so neat. I'll tell you two things. One thing is it specifically brought down in halacha that when we hold the chalot, we're supposed to hold it with all 10 fingers. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you might think like, I'll just like hold it with my hand. It's supposed to hold it with all 10 fingers. I don't want to take the time to get into the reason for that. There's another idea that probably in some of your houses they do and some of your houses they don't. There's a minhag, there's a practice that on Friday night, you're supposed to hold the, the, you, you, that both on Friday night and on Shabbat day, you're supposed to hold the chalot one on top of the other. And on Friday night, you use the bottom challah. And on Shabbat day, you use the top challah. That there's different customs about. But the main thing cited is you're supposed to like have all 10 fingers on the challot. It's a great question. I learned something I didn't know about the 10 fingers. Wow. Um, Rabbi Avi wanted to know, some people still do muksa after their mommy lights candles. And when is the latest time you could do muksa on Arab Shabbat? It's a really good question. So first of all, I should say that in some homes, when the mommy lights candles, everybody starts doing Shabbat. So you have to check with your, with your parents. But technically speaking, or the bottom line is that you have to start the rules of Shabbat a little bit before Shkia. Shkia is what's called sunset. Um, the people who light the candles are supposed to light the candles definitely before that point in time. When they light the candles, normally they're bringing in Shabbat when they light the candles. But technically, if someone in the house is a little bit running late, even if it's after the candles are lit, as long as it's before Shkia, it's okay to keep on doing muksa stuff. 
And that leads me to something that I, maybe the whole class 4B asked is about the 18 minutes. Is that what you mean? That's what I meant. That's what I meant. 18 minutes. Thank you very much. 18 minutes is the preferred time uh, before sunset that someone is supposed to light candles. I just want to tell you, there are some people who are amazing at doing it 18 minutes before. There are a lot of people, there's so much to do before Shabbat. So there are a lot of people who end up lighting a little bit less a little bit closer to Shkia than 18 minutes. And if in your house, they light a little bit closer to Shkia, you should not feel bad because that's what happens in most houses probably. But 18 happened. minutes is the house. best. That has happened in my house. Okay. And it, actually you talked a lot about the chalot and my friend Ayla wanted to know if we need to have two chalot and what if you only have one in your house? It's a very good question. Um, as, as Ayla assumes in the question, you're definitely supposed to have two chalot at every meal. By the way, when we say chalot, we mean two whole chalot, just, just to keep that in mind. Um, if you really only had one challah, you may make hamotzi on one challah, but it would be better if possible to, sometimes this has happened to me over the years, sometimes I was supposed to buy like rolls for Shabbat and I just forgot and it was time for the meal and I didn't have two chalot. And so then, you know, it's so nice to live in a place with so many nice neighbors. Every now and then I've knocked on someone's door and said, do you have maybe like an extra roll or something that I can use? So if that's possible, you should that should be done. But if not, you would make hamotzi on one challah. But the right way to do it is with two chalot. That's good to know. Sometimes in my house, I find the box of matzah if we run into that problem too. And you talked about the, the kiddush coming before hamotzi. And so is that part of why we cover the challah? Because Ilana Sandberg wanted to know about covering the challah. Yes, that's a great question. Probably a lot of you have heard before an idea that we cover the challah, so it shouldn't be embarrassed when you make the kiddush. Probably a lot of you have heard that. So that sounds very strange. Like, what does that mean exactly? So the real explanation is it's based on the question that was asked much earlier, that normally in the laws of brachot, you're supposed to make the hamotzi first. So we're supposed to make the bracha on the kiddush before the hamotzi for Shabbat, but just to show that that's not exactly the way it normally is, that's why we cover the challah. There's a totally different reason why we cover the challah. As somebody already mentioned in the questions, the challah reminds us of the man that fell uh, and that Hashem sent the double portion of the man every Friday. Hashem took so much, such good care of the Jewish people and we're taught that he covered the man both top and bottom in dew to make sure that it wouldn't get messed up at all. And so do is that, is that like wet stuff that's out on the grass in the morning? Yes, thank you very right. much. Right. So um, actually, besides the thing about showing that I would normally make the bracha and the challah first, so I cover it so it's like not a contradiction, I also cover the challah to remind us of the do that Hashem covered the man with to make extra special sure that everything would be good for the Jews. Now, theoretically, there should be something under the challah also, but there always is, whether it be the challah board, whether it be the tablecloth, but there's not really anything over the challah unless I cover it. So that's another reason why we cover it. Oh, that's interesting. You know, my son-in-law uses a challah cover under and a challah cover on top. Oh, neat. Right. Very neat. That's why. Okay. I'm learning so many things, Rabbi Rosenbaum. Thank you so much. I love these questions. These are amazing uh, questions. We're going to keep going because there are so many friends who wanted to ask you questions. Great. Um, there, you, since we're talking about Friday night still, is there a specific time? I have a friend, Yishai Chodov. He wanted to know, is there a specific time when we should eat our Friday night dinner? That's a great question. Um, it's better to eat the Friday night dinner as soon as possible after, sorry for that sound in the background. That's okay. It's better that to eat the in my house, in my, right. in my house. <laughs> It's, it's better to eat the Friday night dinner as soon as possible after Shabbat has begun. Now, of course, if a person goes to show Friday night or a person is davening, saying the tefillot, they could definitely wait until after they've said the tefillot. But once a person gets home and is ready, that would be the best time to do it. If for some reason people weren't able to eat it right away Friday night, maybe they just needed to rest a little bit, maybe you know, you have to take care of something important, it's okay to eat it later Friday night also. But it's such a special mitzvah to make the kiddush and eat the Friday night dinner. We try to do it as soon as possible when Shabbat begins. And we've already said the tefillot. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, 
We're keeping on with this same theme just for a bit, and then we'll switch over. But Akiva Letterman, he wanted to know, why why is it chala? Why can't it be um, a loaf of rye bread? That's a very good question. And Akiva, you might be surprised. It could be a loaf of rye bread if you want it. It would have to be a whole loaf of rye bread. It couldn't be like sliced because it has to be whole. Um, the thing about chalot, it's just sort of become the minhag. It's just become the practice. But um, oh, actually, there's there's a lot of people who have different, they have they, they have special health needs and they can't eat this or they can't eat that. Or mm -hmm. It's interesting, Mrs. Zizou, you just spoke before about matzot for, for, for the chalot. So, you know, so... It doesn't have to be hello. That's really the, the real answer. It's a good question. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, well, it gives us a little flexibility. If we, again, if we're in that situation where you only have one challah, it sounds like Rabbi Rosenbaum is saying, if you have another whole loaf of bread of any kind, that could also be your second one. So you kind of answered that too. Yeah, and I want to give you another backup that comes up sometimes, um, a bagel. It sounds oh. so funny to think about. Now, if it's a sliced bagel, it's not good. But, but a whole bagel, even though it has bagel. a hole in it. Right, so that there's a there's discussion about, but many, many rabbis say, because it's supposed to be made that way, so it's, it's yeah. considered whole, you know, like full. Oh, and but, we uh, always yeah. have those. Great. Okay, well, that was a really good question, Akiva. Um, I have a friend, Tohar, she's in fifth grade, and she wanted to know, does your Kiddush cup have to overflow? It's a really neat question. So I just want to give a little bit of a background for that. The answer to your question, Tohar, is no, but I think I know what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. For Havdalah, the cup is supposed to overflow. The reason why the cup is supposed to overflow for Havdalah is because we do a lot of things for Havdalah that are supposed to be good signs for the week to come. So an overflowing cup is, there's even a phrase, I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard this phrase before, my cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like a sign of like things are going so well for a person. So for Havdalah, it's considered a sign for the coming week. For Kiddush, because we're still in Shabbat, we're not yet making signs for the coming week, um, the cup should be full, but there's no reason for it to be overflowing. Okay, okay. But I like that idea that when the cup runs over, it's a sign or a siman that we want our week to also be so full of good things. It's beautiful. So Shirel has an interesting question also. Why do... And I wanted to combine it with another another friend's question. Shirel wanted to know, why do we cover our eyes for candle lighting? And another person asked a question that was connected, which is Layla wanted to know, why is candle lighting for Shabbat usually a woman's mitzvah? Wow, those are both great, great questions. Okay, let me, let me take the, I'll go in order of how the questions were asked. So there's a very interesting question asked about the bracha on Shabbat candles, because generally speaking, as the second question said, generally speaking, um, when a woman lights Shabbat candles, she's accepting Shabbat when she lights Shabbat candles. Now, normally when we do a mitzvah, we make a bracha before we do the mitzvah. That's normally how it works. So some rabbis say, whoa, Like if whoa. I, sorry to interrupt you, Rabbi, like if I'm going to eat an apple, for example, I would say the bracha on the apple and then I would bite my apple. Right, right, exactly. So even if Thank I'm going to light the Hanukkah for Hanukkah, I would say my right. Oh, okay, got so that's it. that's an excellent example. So when I light for the Hanukkah, I make the brachot and then I light the Hanukkah candles. Okay. So you would think that for Shabbat candles, I would make the bracha and then I would light the Shabbat candles. But we don't do it that way. And the reason we don't do it that way is because when a woman makes the bracha on the Shabbat candles, by making the bracha, it's sort of saying it's Shabbat already. But if it's Shabbat already, she's not allowed to light the candles uh, anymore because you're not allowed to do that on Shabbat. Yes. So the rabbis say, you know what, you know what, light the candles first and then make the bracha. But then there's a problem. And the problem is that I'm it, just as Mrs. Israel said, I'm supposed to make the bracha before I do something. So what should that thing? So so, but I already lit the candles. So the rabbis teach I should light the candles and then right away cover my eyes, and then I'll make the bracha and then I'll uncover my eyes. So then I'm making the bracha before I enjoy the light of the candles. So I'm still making the bracha before something. Got it. I hope that made sense. Now I want to go on to the second great question. And what is the idea of women specifically lighting the Shabbat candles? First of all, it's good to know 
that men also have the mitzvah of the Shabbat candles. Um, in most homes, if there's both a, a man and a woman, a woman is the one who lights the Shabbat candles. But if for some reason a woman wasn't able to light the Shabbat candles or there wasn't a woman in the home, a man should light the Shabbat candles. So the question is, why is it special for women? And the most classic answer given by the rabbis is the woman brings kedusha, a special spirit, into the home. And the Shabbat candles, first of all, the Shabbat candles are so beautiful when you think about it, but the Shabbat candles represent the special kedusha of Shabbat. Now, I want to be very clear. The woman brings kedusha into the home no matter what she does during the day. There are some women who are working at an office all day. There are some women who are at home all day and everything in between. We're not talking about that. What we're saying is that regardless of a woman's schedule, there's a special kind of spirit that the woman has the greatest power to bring into the home. And that's why she's the one who lights the Shabbat candles. That's very beautiful. How Leila Frankel, she wanted to know, is there a limit to how many candles she can light? It's a really good question. The answer is no, there's no limit. Um, there are different minhagim about how many candles a woman lights. The, the basic obligation is for everybody to light two candles. By the way, even if someone was never married, or, you know, was making lighting Shabbat candles for themselves, they would light two candles. Many people have the minhag that they light based on the number of children the mother has. That's not an obligation, but many people have that practice. Um, and there are other reasons also why a person might like more candles, but uh, no limit on how many candles you like. Interesting. Okay. So I'm going to switch to a different topic. My, my friend Kayla, she wanted to know, when a grown-up blesses the children Friday night at the table and puts hands on the children's heads. Is there a reason that we put hands on the head? It's a really, it's a really neat question and there's a really neat idea about it. Uh, I've seen written in Sfarim before that when someone gives someone else a bracha, it's like they're sharing a special spiritual force with them. And by putting the hands on the child's head, it's like the force is like, flowing into them that that's the idea so it's so much love and so much bracha and so much special feeling for shabbat it's all just flowing into the person right wow that is very very interesting that's it feels special it feels really special and i think that when when a parent does that they really are taking a moment to express their special love for their children i love i love i love i love giving brachot to my children Friday night. And by the way, not everybody does it. In other words, it could no. be that in some homes, but but it is a very, many people do it. And for me, it's one of the highlights of Shabbat. It's yeah, it wasn't special. the custom in my home growing up and I still always felt loved. But it's a beautiful thing to see when, when some families have that custom. It's really beautiful. So Safir asked, she said that she sees some people dip their Havdalah candle down into the wine or the grape juice. Um, and some people pour the wine or the grape juice onto the candle and some people blow it out. So is there one thing that's right about that? Okay, so the bottom line is all those things are okay. If that's what you see in your home, they're all okay. There is some discussion about it. There are some people who specifically have the practice of not wanting to blow out candles in general, especially for a mitzvot. They don't like to blow out candles because a candle represents a soul. And so they just like get nervous in general about blowing out candles. There are some people like that. The main thing brought in halacha is to put out the candle in the grape juice. Either way that you mentioned, I think is fine. And the reason is a really interesting reason. We want it to be obvious that both the candle and the grape juice that you're about to drink are all in honor of the mitzvah. So right. by putting out the candle with the grape juice, it makes it very obvious that I didn't just light the candle because I wanted some more light in the room and I'm not just drinking the grape juice because I was thirsty. It's like all connected to the mitzvah. That's the main reason for doing it that way. Interesting. I didn't know that either. That's beautiful. Um, I was, um, I think that you touched on this and I just wanted to show um, Michal Natanov that I think that you touched on this, that 
why do we only bless the children on Friday night? And maybe it's part of that love and that connection between a parent and a child. Is that what you would say? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's, I think that's a great question, but yeah. I think it's, I think it's very true. I think it's a great way to start Shabbat. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, just very meaningful. I think so. I agree. Louis Hesching wanted to know, you know, we talked about Sudash Lishit, that there are three meals of Shabbat. And he was curious, can his breakfast, if his um, mom or dad gives him breakfast in the morning, can that count as one of the three meals? It's a really, really good question. And a lot of adults ask me that kind of question too. I'll tell you what I would say. Could be other rabbis would say something different. So you could always check with your own personal rabbi. I'll tell you what I would say. Um, as some of the people asked before, the halacha is you're supposed to make hamotzi on some type of bread for the first two sudot of Shabbat. Now it happens to be that for sudash and sheet, it's preferred to make hamotzi, but it doesn't have to be hamotzi. But it's not that I can pick one of the three meals and not make hamotzi on that mm-hmm. meal. It's specifically the third one, the third one I can be lenient about. So it's tough. So to maybe count. if you wanted to have your Shabbos cereal at five in the afternoon, it could work. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. Now, I'll tell you also for the halacha of sudash lishit, it's specifically supposed to be that you're having it in the afternoon. There is something about the timing of it also. Yeah, so that would work if you like flip the order. That's, uh, I think cereal and milk, by the way, is good at any time of day. It I'm is. A, it's I'm good. a big it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Right? I agree with that. Absolutely. Okay. So I have a friend, Maytal Kugler. She's a third grader and she wants to know, why can't we use mukta? Yeah, I that's think an excellent... this, maybe what she even means even more is like to touch muksa. Right. You know, right. so I want to tell you the idea of muksa is from the rabbis. It's from a very long time ago, but it's 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 from the rabbis. And there's different opinions as to why they started the rules of muksa. There's a lot of things that we don't touch or move on Shabbat. The basic reason is because the rabbis felt that people were not living connected enough to Shabbat. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about it, a lot of Shabbat is what I don't do. I want to make another point to you. We use electricity all the time. Before electricity, a person could have sat around a long time on Shabbat Mm. and not be tempted to do it. For us, it's very hard to not use electricity on Shabbat. So the rabbis felt that they wanted to make it that like almost every moment of Shabbat, person had a constant reminder that Shabbat is a special day. And, and therefore, to even not move this or not move that, uh, that's basically the idea of muksa. So you know what, Rabbi, you also answered Emily Ovadia's question, which was, why can't we use electricity? Yeah, that's a famous, 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 famous question. <laughs> um, and I'll just give you two really fast ideas, and not all the rabbis agree, but Generally speaking, it boils down to one or the other. One is I'm not allowed to make something on Shabbat. So if you think of all the stuff that you use electricity with, when you can't plug it in or you can't turn it on, it's like not even useful. So by turning on the electricity, I'm like making it be able to work. So it's sort of like creating something on Shabbat, like creating a new vessel, a new uh a new toy or a new, you know, or a new utensil. That's one possibility. The other possibility is much more technical. The other possibility has to do with when I when I use electricity, I'm closing a circuit. And that's you you can, I don't know how much you've learned about that in science, and maybe you will, but that might be a little bit considered like building by closing a circuit. There's there's the rabbis have been discussing this for many, many years. But, you know, the rabbis have worked really hard to make sure we don't sit in the dark, right? Because we can actually. We can have the benefit of electricity as long as we're not closing the circuit ourselves with our own hands. That's right. So that's something that the rabbis must have worked very, very hard on. Yeah. Were you one of those rabbis, Rabbi Rosenbaum? I was not. (laughs) I think it was before you were born, but we're very lucky because it must have been hard to be in the dark. You know, sometimes it's, yeah. So we're very, very blessed. Okay. I have, you know, we're getting there and I really appreciate your time. I think we have five or six more questions. Great. I'm lo- I'm loving this. The only thing that's making me sad is I'm not looking at the children's faces as, I'm, as I'm, I am don't get to see them. Too. We're sad about that too. And you know, boys and girls, do you want to know why Rabbi Rosenbaum's not able to come to Onik? He wanted to come. 
but our Oneg Shabbat has to be, because we have, you know, we have a Masorah in the lower school also, and we're not very flexible about it either. And our Oneg Shabbat has to be the last, last thing before we go home for Shabbat. Oh, that's so, that sounds so fun. And Rabbi Rosenbaum, he wanted to come, but he has to do carpal for his children. So yes. <laughs> Rabbi Rosenbaum is an Abba. Isn't that amazing? Right. So we all have a lot of different jobs, but one day, please God, um, when it's not this time of day, um, hopefully Rabbi Rosenbaum. I would love that. I would love that. We're so excited to, that you're really answering our questions as if we're grownups. It's amazing. Thank you. Okay. So Josh Rabin, he wants to know, why do people say different types of Kiddush words on Shabbat day? And I'll tell you what, when we made our Havdalah cards, Rabbi, I printed two kinds. I printed one that was Ashkenaz. And one Havdalah, it's much longer for our Sephardi friends in school. So I don't know, that might be one of the reasons that Kiddush is different in different homes, but that's Josh's question. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so Josh, to understand that, I first have to just clarify something for you. It's the, you know what the main part of Kiddush is in, on Shabbat day? It's the bracha of Borei Pri Agafen. So I could yes. just say that? Well, you theoretically could, but the rabbis thought it would be nice to say some sukim about Shabbat before you go into Borei Pri mm -hmm. because it kind of gets you in the mode and it also makes it very clear that you're not just having a cup of grape juice because you want grape juice, but you're yeah. doing it in honor of Shabbat. So some people say one pasuk. Some people say a section of psukim. Some people have like two different sections of psukim that they like to say. Some people say a phrase from one pasuk. I agree with you, Josh. A lot of people do different things for Shabbat, for the, the Kiddush of Shabbat day. But really the main part, according to everybody, is the bracha of Borei Priya Gafen. Okay. And the first part are the introductory psukim and different minagim as to what to do. Well, I have a couple of Kiddush questions that are, that are coming, and these I think are the last two Kiddush questions, but since you were talking about Kiddush, Karen Lasita wanted to know, why is Kiddush different on Friday night than on Shabbat day? Amazing question. Yeah. So the mitzvah of Kiddush is a mitzvah from the Torah. The, the mitzvah from the Torah is to say Kiddush once on Shabbat. And so we say it at the beginning of Shabbat. The, the Friday night Kiddush, um, we not only say Borei Pri Agafen, we say a whole beautiful bracha about how special Shabbat is. We don't say that at the Shabbat day Kiddush because there we already really did the mitzvah the night before. The Shabbat day Kiddush is just to kind of to keep us in the spirit of Shabbat. Um, so the Friday night Kiddush is Borei Pri Agafen because we're having grape juice, a bracha about Shabbat because we're doing the special mitzvah, and then psukim that are specifically about the beginning of Shabbat. So it wouldn't make sense to say those Shabbat day. But that's why you're, that's a very good observation. Friday night Kiddush is very different than Shabbat day Kiddush. It is different. And then Chaya wanted to know, um, Zakar, Chaya Zakar, Emily Zakar, she wanted to know, why do we use grape juice or wine and why not apple juice or orange juice or one of those? Great question. When I just mentioned before that the Torah says that we should make Kiddush. On Shabbat. The rabbis said it's not enough to say the words of Kiddush. We have to do it over a beverage, over a drink. Yeah. Why? Because the rabbis wanted us to feel that Kiddush was special because it is, because it's talking about how lucky we are to have Shabbat. Now, we can understand where the rabbis are coming from because there are a lot of brachot and tefillot that we say. And you know what we do? We say them really fast a lot of times. A lot of times we kind of aren't even thinking that much about it. But I think we all feel that Kiddush is special. And part of what makes Kiddush special is the fact that we're like about to drink something focuses on us much better. And the rabbi said, if we're going to ask people to do it over a drink, let's think about what's the most special drink. What's mm. the best way to honor Kiddush? And therefore they decided that the best way to do Kiddush would be on wine or grape juice because those are the most special drinks. They are special. They are special because we don't even usually drink those at our regular dinner table. So it is pretty special. Yeah. Right. Um, a couple more. We're going to talk for a minute about Havdalah. So what, one of the questions about Havdalah is about bas, Besamim and it came from Miriam Pavlotsky and why do we spell, why do we smell Besamim? 
And I'll tell you another one, just in case they all go together. Ariel Berman wanted to know about the candle. And, and I can remind you of them again. And then the other one that Arye wanted to know was, why is there Havdalah at all? Wow. All, all questions are really great. Um, I'm going to kind of go in opposite order this time, if that's okay. okay. Yep. So the rabbis decided that we need to make Havdalah. If there's a mitzvah of Kiddush, that we begin Shabbat by talking about how special it is to have Shabbat. You know what it's like? Imagine if you were at a party and someone got up at the beginning of the party and said, I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you all for coming. And then you had a great time. And then when the party was over, everyone just left. It would feel a little bit weird. It would be like, if it's special to have you, then before you leave, goodbye. what'd you say? Like as if they didn't even say goodbye. Right. Before you leave, we have to formally say goodbye because formally saying goodbye is a way of showing how special it was to have the guest. Right. So Kiddush is like welcoming Shabbat and Havdalah is like saying goodbye to Shabbat. So right. that, that's that's for Havdalah. Um, the idea of Bissamim, it's very interesting. The smell is considered the most spiritual sense. You know, we have five senses. Smell is considered the most spiritual sense. The reason why it's considered the most spiritual sense, some of you have probably learned in Breshit, that when Hashem breathed a neshama into Adam, he did it through his nose. So smell is considered the most spiritual sense. And basically, we, we're, we're on a spiritual down after no. Shabbat has left. So to kind of replenish our spiritual sense, we smell something nice. That's the idea of Psamim. And the last one, the candle, this is a really neat one. The Midrash teaches us that the first fire that was ever made was made by Adam after Shabbat, Saturday night, after Shabbat. And because when you think about it, Hashem didn't create fire. Hashem created stuff in this world that I could rub against. I could rub sticks against each other. I could do other, I could rub, turn a match against a, you know, a, a surface and make a fire. So the first fire that was made was after Shabbat. So to remind us of that fire that was made, we make a bracha on a candle after Shabbat. And I just want to say, whenever I talk about this, I tell people, if the bracha on the candle is like thanking Hashem for giving us the ability to invent things. Adam invented fire. People wow. today are inventing things. It's such a neat way to start the week. Hashem, somebody somewhere is going to invent something this week. Yeah. We're all using stuff that's been invented by people, and you gave us the wisdom. Thank you, Hashem. Oh, that's very special. And you know, the boys and girls in school are also very creative, and they invent things. Okay. things. So it's, uh, it's lovely for us to think about that. I think I have three more, even though about six questions ago, I said we were almost done. I think there are three more. <laughs> um, Vered Karkowski wants to know, why do we daven in shul? So maybe she's asking, why shouldn't I just daven at home? Why is no, it Great question. First of all, it's okay to daven at home. People daven at home for all kinds of reasons. By the way, with COVID, there are still <laughs> some people who, for different reasons, maybe are, it's, more, it's very important for them to daven at home. But there's all kinds of reasons why a person would have it at home. But I'll tell you, um, I actually had COVID recently, and I wasn't able to go to shul on Shabbat. And I really Are you feeling well now, Rabbi? Baruch Hashem. Thank you Baruch so much. Hashem. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great. But um, thank you very much. But uh, I think the nicest part of going to shul for Tfilot is because we're showing ourselves how much we connect with other Jews and how all of us together come before Hashem. It's kind of like a family party. <laughs> Imagine every now and then, for those of you who are fortunate enough to have grandparents, every now and then, all the cousins get together and come to the grandparents' house. And it's, it's almost more special when we're all together with the family. All of the Jewish people are one big family. So I think to come to Shul is really special. It's like we're going to Hashem's house by, by coming to Shul with everybody else together. I think it's very nice. And I think we re we really understand that, Rabbi Rosenbaum, because, you know, as you know, we were all, for a while, we were all had to be doing school from home. And we were so happy when we all came together. And there was just that feeling like how important it was to be learning together totally. and learning together. And so we understand that feeling. And when we go to shul, it's that same feeling that we're davening the same words, but now we're davening together. 
So I understand that. That's very, very good. Um, Pearl asked, why does Shabbat start at a specific time? Hmm. Neat. So the halacha is that um, the, every day on the Jewish calendar actually doesn't begin in the morning. It begins at night. And there's a neat lesson about that because at night it's all dark. Hmm. And when morning comes, it brightens up. And that's how the life is. Sometimes wow. things aren't going so well, but we can always count on things to gradually get better. We're always moving upwards. Like that's our goal. So in any event, so the halacha is that Shabbat begins when it becomes, when it begins to get dark on Friday night. So that's why it has to be a very specific time. And, and uh, Mrs. Israel, I think one of the other questions on the list was, why does it change different times of year? Shabbat is at different times. Yes. Of, right? yes. Who asked that? Who asked that? I will find it and I will tell you. You can explain okay, it. Okay, sorry. So that was also a great, I'll keep looking. Okay, that was also a great question. And the idea for that is because the same idea, that Shabbat has to begin right before it gets dark Friday night, right before sunset. Um, but different times of year, sunset comes at different times. But it's, sometimes it's hard to get used to this time of year, Shabbat is one time, that time of year, Shabbat is another time. Yes, Yeah. Goodness, I'm looking for it. Some of the friends asked more than one question, but we, we only picked one out of each of your questions. Mm, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. No, 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 I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it um, because there were so many. So, so many um, good questions. Yeah, they were fantastic. Yeah. They were fantastic. And you know what? Um, oh, it was Lenny. And we did answer Lenny's question about the two halot and the four, the two man and the four halot. And, but Lenny also asked about the different times. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for checking. And sure. Lenny will be happy that you answered that also. And the last one that we didn't get to, because we answered every other friend's question, was Alana Gabriel asked about mommy covering her eyes. And I think you answered it already. I think that you answered when when whoever's lighting the candles in the house um, makes the circles and covers their eyes. And I don't think it matters if it's one circle or two circles or three circles. I think we just, that idea you explained was about the um, cover eyes. It is true. It, a lot of is right. I think it's common to do it three times. I'm going to tell you something that it's very important for you all to hear. I'm a rabbi. I know, thank God, I know a certain amount about Judaism. You know, Alana, why is it three times? I don't no. And, 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 and there's That's important I, here. Yeah, yeah. And I bet there are people that know it could be that, that what you'll go home and you'll ask one of the parents will know. And if anybody wants to contact me afterwards and tell me the reason, I'd love to hear it, but we're all building on our knowledge all the time. Me too. There, there are new things. Mrs. Israel was kind enough to say things that she hadn't heard before. There are things that I also haven't heard before that people share with me. You know, it's very appropriate that it's Alana's question. And I'll tell you why, Rabbi, because Alana's a third grader and the third graders are learning Rashi now for the first time. And mm-hmm. if I remember co- correctly, I think there's even a place in the Chumash where Rashi says, I don't know. Isn't yeah, there? That's right. yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah. even Rashi, who we've been learning is just one of the most incredible understanders of our Torah doesn't know every single thing. Only Hashem knows every single thing. So Rabbi Rosenbaum, we have been so blessed that you joined us today. We're Thank so grateful much. that you took our questions so seriously and you answered every single one. You answered every single one of our questions and we feel very, very lucky that you joined us today. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all for the wonderful questions. Thank you, Mrs. Zizzo, for the opportunity. And I just want to say, I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but it was made me so happy. There are so many names of people that I know that I see a lot, sometimes a lot, sometimes a little. I was so excited to hear your specific questions. I just didn't want to interrupt every time oh. I heard a name that I knew, but a lot of the names were people that I knew. It was really exciting That's for me. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Boys and girls, if you see Rabbi Rosenbaum in the neighborhood, you can say hello and you can say, Rabbi Rosenbaum, I asked you a question at the Oneg. So Rabbi Rosenbaum, we want to wish you a good Shabbos Thank and you a Shabbat too. Shalom. Thank and you. Um, we hope that your your Shabbos is is one of Shalom and your that your Havdalah cup runs over so that you have a beautiful weekend. Amen. Thank you for you two and for everybody. A good Shabbos and a Shabbat Shalom. And I really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Bye-bye.